Welcome to another episode of What's On Your Mind, a show hosted by the Institute of Trading and Portfolio Management, where we'll be talking to the Institute's senior trading mentors about what's been on their mind in the financial markets over the last week. I'm Chris Quill, and today I'm joined by Chris Cathy and Anthony Iser. Now, just before we jump into the show, I want to remind you guys watching that if you want to learn more about the sort of material that we cover in these episodes or learn more about trading and investing in general, then head over to our website itpm.com and from there you can find a lot of different links to various educational resources. So things like our live upcoming seminars, our online video education, our bite-sized videos and mentoring programs that we do around the world as well. So with that being said, let's jump straight back into the show and Chris, I think we'll start with you this week. What's been on your mind? Well, um, just to sort of, we're filming this on Thursday the 11th of October, so um, the uh, the big move last night in uh, the US, which we'll talk about later on, but uh, this is something that we have been talking about, I guess, for at least a few months. Um, uh, just to sort of start what's on my mind right here, right now, um, first thing is looking at Europe, as I focus a lot on um, Europe um, and just a sort of quick look at the economic fundamentals in Europe. Uh, first thing is that the European sentiment indicator, the ESI, it does appear the rate of growth is slowing and slowing hard in Europe. Um, still at elevated levels on a historical level, but it does look as though um, the rate of growth is clearly slowing. The inflation around about 2%, core inflation around 2%, very much driven by um, food and energy in, in Europe. Um, so it's banging around about the uh, the ECB's target rate around about 2%. Moving into the ECB, interest rates negative um, and quantitative easing sort of seems to be sort of coming to an end, but um, it, are, are we in a situation where growth is slowing in Europe? Inflation's at the ECB's target rate, interest rates are at zero, quantitative easing has played out. Uh, really what can the ECB do to stimulate growth again in, in, in Europe. It does seem to be sort of a, a bit of a difficult situation and quite difficult to get bullish too much on the the, the economies in Europe. Um, that's kind of the first thing is how does this play out? Yeah, we've clearly, we've talked about huge underperformance of um, other, other uh, economies and other uh, markets relative to the US, but I think um, I mean, on just an absolute basis, it's typically too bullish on Europe right here, right now. Uh, Anthony, I think you've probably got something similar in, um, in, in Australia, haven't you? Yeah, well, this whole part of the world, Chris, is uh, under sort of constant pressure in Singapore here uh, and the emerging markets around here are under all sorts of pressure and China being the big focus with their internal problems, uh, debt uh, galore. Uh, the impact of tariffs and how that's all going to play out. So, yeah, I've been looking uh, at the Australian dollar as a potential way of uh, getting exposure to that. Uh, so it remains strongly linked to Chinese growth. Uh, the lending and construction cycle uh, in China obviously uses a huge amount of resources. Historically, that's tailing away, but demand uh, still comes from there in terms of driving what uh, exports yeah. Australia has. So that link is strong. Uh, yeah. And tariffs, as you know, Chris, we don't really know. What, <laughs> uh, you see the comments in the ISM uh, reports and lots of the sectors are talking about it, uh, but the bottom line probably hasn't been impacted too much just yet. But Tariffs are tax and taxes aren't good and tariffs are not yeah. good. But, um, so while those risks are abound, uh, the Australian market or the Australian dollar looks interesting. Yeah. So there's one caveat, and I know this is something that you look at a bit, Chris, and uh, so does Anton, which is the commitment of traders. And the market is pretty short, uh, the Australian dollar already, but historically that hasn't meant that this is sort of an overplayed trade uh, yeah. In fact, when they get this short, they tend to be sort of right uh, and the currency goes down and they sort of reduce that position over time. Yeah. And this makes me feel quite good about it, which it comes to what you were talking to, alluding to the economic situation uh, in Australia. Certainly much better than Europe. Uh, GDP is sort of 3.5% or 3.4% in the last quarter. Unemployment's at 5.5%. Uh, but there are a few things that are starting to weigh on it a little bit. 
there is a big underemployment uh, issue in Australia, so there is a lot of slack uh, in the economy. So we won't see uh, wage growth of any note. I wouldn't have thought. Um, despite seeing 5.3 unemployment rate, you'd think that might come through. Uh, and then consumer confidence uh, has re been rebounding quite strongly. Um, and that, uh, but that's, that's expected to weaken a little bit. And more importantly, consumer spending is likely to weaken because uh, the housing market's been down for near enough to 12 months. Expectations are that's to, to continue. And the wealth effect, as you know, um, when people see their uh, their net wealth drying up, uh, even if it's just on paper, they put their hands in their pockets and keep them. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so so I think you know, you're going to see continued um, reductions in in spending. The biggest thing, though, and uh, Chris, I think you've got a chart of this that you can pop up, is the cash differential with the US as well is uh, another tailwind for this uh, view uh, of, of shorting the Australian dollar. Historically, yeah. when uh, uh, the cash rate uh, differential blows out, and at the moment it's at sort of one and a half percent premium in the US, the Aussie dollar is under a lot of pressure. Uh, yeah, the last sort of, was sort of this, this low was sort of 99, 2000. Now, there was obviously other things at play as well, um, you know, history, doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes, uh, is, yeah. as the famous saying goes. Uh, and the Aussie dollar was under 50 cents at that point in time. Jesus. So, yeah, I'm not expecting it to go there, and I would have thought the RBA sort of starts intervening a little bit if it gets into the mid-60s. But yeah. it, it's going to be under a lot of pressure. Um, yeah. and I mentioned the community, consumer uh, confidence number rebounding. Uh, that was on the back of the political turmoil and Malcolm Turnbull being booted out and yeah. you know, the dumpster fire that is Australian politics. Um, it yeah. seems to be the issue everywhere in the world. We'll, we'll, oh. we'll leave the US to one side. I don't think... <laughs> okay, no, we're we're talking about Trump. Yeah. yeah, exactly. What about Brexit though, Chris? I mean, uh, from here, that looks like a dumpster fire in itself. Oh, man, it's an absolute disaster. Um, it's funny, so talk about Australian politics, I think there's a lot of similarities between the dynamics of the parties in Australia and the dynamics of the parties in the, in the UK. Uh, it yeah. seems very much like a kindergarten, and it's frankly quite embarrassing, I find. Um, but it's, it's funny, you talked about sort of the, the, the cash differential between Australia and uh, the US, exactly the same analogy into Europe, actually with less um, GDP growth, we're only going about 2% in Europe, and employment, unemployment's only about sort of just short of about well, 6 now, 7% in there, uh, so slightly more negative, I guess, in Europe. Uh, but in terms of Brexit, well, living in the UK, we are Brexit bombarded. It's frankly getting a bit, a little bit boring. But just run you through a sort of a, a quite a few numbers. Um, UK exports just short of uh, half of its exports into uh, into Europe, and its imports are just over a half. We've got a um, from Europe. We've got a surplus. Sorry, an overall deficit of around about. 67 billion, which is a roughly around about just over sort of 10% um, of the total um, total trade um, between the UK imports and exports. But compared to the major European economies, um, we run substantial deficits. Um, into compared to Germany, we run around a 25 billion pound uh, deficit, trade uh, trade deficit. France, pretty flat, but. Um, Moving into Netherlands, Italy, Spain, and Belgium, they're all between 15 and 20 billion deficits. So clearly, the import, the UK imports a hell of a lot more than it exports to Europe. Now, what does this mean? From a UK perspective, we are being told that this is very negative for the U for the UK. I would say this is, looks more negative for Europe because what does Europe do? Now we've got a, at the backdrop. We've got uh, populist right wing governments in Italy. We've got them in Poland. We've got them in Hungary. So we have, and this, the, the general sort of a pickup in social unrest because of immigration or whatever it may be. But I think, especially in Germany, it's been sort of hitting the headlines recently with a few um, incidents. And the, the, the point is here is that maybe this is not that bad for the UK, but potentially very negative for Europe. What does the European Parliament do? What do the negotiators do? What does Barnier do? Um, do they go for a hard Brexit? punish the UK for leaving uh, Europe, what does this mean? Probably some kind of tariff 
tariffs on imports and exports between uh, on the trade between the uh, UK and Europe. <clears throat> Europe's got more to here. It, it seems hard not to think that they'll do that. I mean, it's well, exactly. That's that seems like the obvious thing. Yeah, I mean, bikey gangs. If you try and leave a bikey gang, they beat you up and exactly. And if I leave, who's off? I mean, you know, no one wants you to leave, and the EU's no. not going to want you to leave either. No, exactly. And if, if the UK wants to leave, they're not going to make it easy. They're not going to say, "Okay, guys, here's the door. Do you want a taxi?" Um, so I think there's a risk that right here, right now, the EU pushes too hard. We come to a hard Brexit, no deal. UK uh, flips back to World Trade Organization rules, and which will probably involve some tariffs on trade between U UK and Europe. Okay, what does this mean? Europe exports more to the UK than it imports. Clearly, potentially very negative for European exporters to the UK. Um, as funny, BMW, which Stock mentioned a couple of weeks ago, um, had a profit warning and didn't really mention Brexit. I think this is more to do with the sort of general state of the global economy, but there was clearly a risk of. A, some kind of tariff issue between the UK and Europe. What does that do for Europe? Well, very likely to push the European Parliament could very well push uh, the European economy into recession. Growth is already slowing. The lean indicator is already slowing. Um, a little nudge on the back of the shoulder of the, of the growth numbers could very well push the, the European economies into recession. Is that going to make the European Parliament popular, given the fact that we've got a populist backdrop? Clearly not. On the flip side, what does uh, do, do the UK, does the European negotiators uh, do they push for a soft Brexit, maintain trade and um, uh, free trade between the UK and Europe? Clearly, the UK doesn't want to have a uh, free movement of people. The soft Brexit. So, can the U can the European negotiators run the risk of the UK leaving on the same terms where it is now? Well, actually, on better terms for the for the UK, but clearly not because then what's the point of having the EU? So it seems to me right here, right now, is this is a lose-lose situation for everybody. And I think it's potentially going to be more lose for Europe than it will be for, for the UK. So, Chris, are there any countries in, in Europe apart from, well, obviously Britain's already on its way, but any countries that you see at risk of leaving, let's say, uh, are there any countries you're looking at in particular in that scenario? Well, the obvious one to look at is Italy. Um, now, I have talked about Italy previously, but uh, just as a quick update, um, first of all, sort of surprising enough that the Italian government bond market, well, the Italian bond market overall, is the fourth largest in the world, uh, roughly around about two and a half to three trillion dollars, uh, which is roughly around about 130, 140 percent of GDP, way beyond the um, the EU target um, for countries to meet the sort of criteria to stay in the euro. Um, the spread of the Italian government the tenure over the German Bund, which is the benchmark in Europe, is around about 3%. So you're getting paid 3% more to lend money to the Italian government than you are to the German government. Uh, why would that be the case, given the fact that we've got the same currency? It doesn't quite make sense, but clearly uh, we've got a right-wing, well, we've got a sort of a right-wing, left-wing coalition in, um, in Italy between the Five Star Movement and the League, which is the former Northern League in uh, Italy. Um, very, very, we've got one sort of commonality, they both have a problem with immigration. Again, that comes back to the sort of one of the issues, well, the key issue, in my opinion, about Brexit was controlling immigration. Uh, clearly have a free problem of, uh, a problem of free movement of people across Europe. Um, however, slightly different on the, on the politics and the economics is that the Five Star, the left-wing um, part of the coalition, wants to um, tax and spend, increase government spending to stimulate Italy. The Northern League, or the League as it's called now, the right-wing part of the coalition, wants to cut taxes. So either way, it's very difficult to get bullish on uh, Italian bonds here. Hence, the major Italian banks, Unicredito and uh, Intesa San Paolo, have dropped by roughly around 35 to 40% over the last six months. Uh, is it going to change? Uh, very difficult to get bullish right here, right now. Is it going to have a snapback? Yes, of course. Nothing ever goes up down a straight line. But fundamentally, I think Italy potentially poses a bigger risk to the, the European uh, project than, uh, than the UK. So we covered a bit of um, macro situations there. Let's switch back to you, Anthony. Um, have you been looking at anything from more of a, a bottom-up perspective? Yeah, I have, Chris, and it sort of it's come on the back of some economic data. Uh, there's a chart that uh, you can pop up that lumber versus the ISM uh, composite PMI, and it's a huge fall in uh, the lumber prices, uh, and it's got people 
a little bit worried about uh, construction and the housing numbers are still sort of strong, but not as strong as they have been. Um, and the the share prices in the in all the sort of construction related stocks uh, sectors, uh, I should say, uh, have been under pressure. Uh, yeah. And so, yeah, like, so. Back to thinking about there was a there's a guy on uh, the Thailand uh, men, mentoring program, uh, vacation program, uh, maybe 18 months ago, uh, that looked at a, it's not a, obscure, but it's, uh, it's certainly not a massively well-known name and it's got, uh, it's T-Rex, Trex, uh, not the seventies. <laughs> <rock metal. laughs> good band, by the way. Yeah, very good band. Um, but they, uh, they make, uh, composite wood products, um, for, uh, for outdoor uh, uh, renovations and housing construction decks and things like that. And why he looked at it initially was um, it was around about the time of Hurricane Katrina, uh, and again, the same thing was happening. These sectors were under a little bit of pressure. He knew the company well, so we did a bottom-up work then, and it looked very interesting. Um, and, it, and, and he was spot on, and the stock had performed very well. Uh, but like the rest of the sector, it's down 25% uh, over the last little while. Uh, and I just thought I'll sort of go and revisit it and just see if it's potentially the baby getting thrown out with the bathwater because these guys uh, actually you know, broadly compete with wood. Uh, yeah. Lumber prices going down for them is a, is, a, is a good thing because they use sort of scrap wood uh, in their products um, and they're taking market share from wood, the biggest player. And as terrible as it is, uh, all this uh, weather conditions in the southern part of the US knocking down people's houses mean that you know, they've got to be built again. Um, so there's a lot of construction going on. Uh, yeah. a lot of the renovation work as well, um, as the you know, with interest rates rising, people are a little bit concerned, and quite rightly, um, that the construction cycle and the housing cycle in the US might slow down a little bit. What often happens is instead of building a new house, people just say, well, I might put a little extension on the back or do a new deck and um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. go that way. And uh, so of the remodeling, as it's called in the US, renovation market, uh, as it's called elsewhere, uh, outdoor is sort of 30 odd percent, 35 percent of that spend. So it's it looks very interesting. I think it is yeah. potential baby that's thrown out with the bath water. Uh, and at this point in time as well, it's, it's a, it fits our process. Uh, the PE yeah. is, is higher than the sector, but not outrageously so. It's trading on 33 times with very good growth. So, you know, it's a premium to the sector, but not, not, a, not a skyrocket PE by any means. And the only issue, and, and again, Part of the process, it's still trending down along with the sector. So uh, I'm just going to sit on my hands at the moment and just do a little bit more work. But it does look very interesting. Uh, the results are out on October 29, so I, I'm wanting to make a decision before then because they've, yeah. they've had four beats in a row, and uh, there's nothing obvious to suggest that uh, uh, that there should be any issues this time. Uh, obviously, you never can tell, but this one it looks quite interesting. And uh, yeah, that's so a, anyway, that sounds like a great idea, Anthony. That sounds like a really good, really good idea. I think I like the old um, lumber prices being positive for this company. That's a good idea, actually. I like it. Yeah, yeah. And there was look, it was just great that it came out. I, it wasn't a company I'd heard of before, but it came out yeah. in a you know in a ten mentee uh, uh, mentor yeah. program in Thailand uh, where everyone got to share ideas and processes. So yeah, that sounds so like a that, good process. Yeah, and I mean, look. Um, so yeah, that's. I think that looks quite interesting. Uh, and I guess the only other thing, just broadly, I'm thinking about and perhaps talking with uh, the mentees who we deal with is they're new to markets and new to market cycles. And while we can't pick tops and bottoms, and when uh, transitions and rotations happen, feels very much like we could be in that inflection point now, Chris. Whether yeah. it's you know, whether it's now or three months or six months. But uh, I had uh, one mentee, very smart guy, um, and learned a sort of valuable lesson last night. 
on, on a couple of fronts. He got stopped out on sort of half a dozen positions in the decline. Right. And so learn a little bit about having those very excessive high PE names. Uh, uh, they're great when things are roaring along, but we probably want to drag the, the, the extremes back down to a small volume <clears throat> to the market. Uh, but more importantly, he learned about risk management and having those <laughs> on and waking up in the morning and finding, okay, I got stopped out, yeah. uh, but my loss is this. And uh, I knew up front that that was my potential loss on those trades. Uh, yeah. And lives to fight another day. Uh, yeah. So well, that's, you know, that's the most important, most important thing I think is to live to fight another day. You can lose the battle, but just never be in a position to lose the war. And I think um, clearly the, the price action of the US last night. So your guy got sort of stopped out in six positions, which is like I say, it's all well and good when the market's paying for for growth. But one of the things that we have been taught about is is the market paying a realistic price for price for growth, and is there going to be a rotation out of growth? into sort of more defensive or more value names. Um, what we saw yesterday, clearly there's a lot of pain in the market because something like Netflix down 8 9%, that doesn't smack to me of a very healthy healthy market. You know, are we going to have some kind of, um, you know, we talked about this rotation, as you just touched on. It would seem to me that given the performance of the last 8, 9, 10 years of growth over defensives and cyclicals, uh, sorry, uh, value, um, this is not going to just take place in one day. This could well be a theme as you, and I, I think I completely agree with you. We are potentially at an inflection point, which is probably going to take three, six, 12 months to play out, potentially. And so, Chris, uh, you mentioned in a previous chat, I think it was with, um, oh, actually, don't recall who was on the other end, but I recall what you said, and you were talking about um, just reducing risk and reducing exposure. Is that something in terms of, how do you see that in terms of? Oh, absolutely. Well, I think right here, right now, I mean, obviously, I work with the VIX as um, sort of as a handle on how you should be positioned. Um, over the course of the last five, six trading days, we've gone from around about 12 and a half on the VIX, which is below historical averages, to around, I think last night we closed around 24. So clearly, yeah. the market is telling you this is not the, the time to running fully long short, fully invested long short portfolio. You want to. Anybody who's trading right here and now, you want to free up some cash and because the market's giving you a sort of shorter term trading opportunities. Now, we also talk about sort of long short versus uh, day trading or shorter term trading, but now the market is in the window where maybe there are some shorter term trading ideas and shorter term um, opportunities if you have the, the stomach and the ability to, to take advantage of those. Um, because when you, in my experience, what we saw yesterday which could well continue is that the market goes from initially it's a it's a market of stocks, long shorts perform differently depending on the economic fundamentals. But when you get big moves up and down, it tends to be the market goes from a market of stocks into a stock market, and a lot of things move together. So it's very much a market call. Yeah, there's, I mean, that seemed to be the sort of the global move in this part of the world yeah. uh, and to your markets as well today. Uh, Sort of down in unison, so it, it yeah. does have that feel about it, uh, yeah. which is why you know I'm going to continue to try and find some of these more uh, slightly obscure names yeah. that be a bit beaten up um, that do get uh, hit with the broad share market sell-off rather uh, than uh, being a stock-specific thing. Well, I think the, the company you mentioned, uh, T-Rex, that sounds to me like exactly the stock you want to be picking in your moments. And look into this is where you do the work, you generate the ideas, and just wait for the entry points. You probably want to keep some keep some powder. Exactly, exactly. But I actually just talk about the performance of a few different things. I mean, I just just want to highlight um, so the year to date, and actually it was even since Brexit, which was June 2016. Um, FTSE 100s up 18%, FTSE 250s up to 21%. Year to date, FTSE's down 5%. 250s mm. down 6%. So these are these things are moving very, very close together. Now that would seem to me that doesn't quite stack up with the, the fundamentals here. Take a little step back, FTSE 100, about 80% of its earnings are overseas, very heavily exposed to the US dollar. FTSE 250, more the sort of mid-cap index in the UK, um, around about 60% of its earnings are domestic. So it's a very much a domestic play. Funny enough, the FTSE 100 is not really indicative of the state of the UK economy. Um, yeah. Given the fact these things have moved lockstep since Brexit and also since the start of the year, that would seem to me like an opportunity. 
if you think that Europe, and also similar, very similar in the DAX, um, the DAX since Brexit's up 21%, the MDAX equivalent of the mid-cap index of 24%, yet a day DAX down 9%, MDAX down 7%, very, very similar performance. That would suggest to me that if you have a view that European economies are going to start to slow, then the typical trade is to be long the big caps, short the small caps. So I just wanted to flag that maybe there's a potential opportunity here. Yeah, okay, sounds good. Okay, so I think that's probably all we've got time for this week on this episode of What's On Your Mind. Um, Chris, Anthony, thank you very much for joining me on the show this week. I look forward to catching up with you guys next time. Now, just as a reminder to you guys watching, um, if you want to learn more about the sort of content that we cover in these episodes or educate yourselves further about trading and investing in general, then do visit our website, itpm.com. And from there, there's a lot of different educational resources that you can take advantage of. So again, things like our live upcoming seminars, our online video courses, bite-sized videos, and mentoring programs that we do around the world. And those mentoring programs are with guys just like Anthony and Chris who can really help you take your trading to the next level. So uh, with that being said, um, I think we're done for this episode. Um, make sure you tune in next time for another episode of What's On Your Mind.